uh, now i would like to begin with the next session which is harve j alt harve j alter session he won the nobel prize prize in physiology or medicine in 2020 for discovery for hepatitis c virus i would like to invite our chairperson for today dr bharat shah from ahmedabad and dr vismay nayak from botad welcome sir and now i would like to uh, i would request dr bharat shah to introduce our next speaker over to you sir yes uh, dr bharat shah sir you can introduce dr matthew john. yes good afternoon uh, we have first speaker dr matthew john who is going to speak on adapting latest ada esd treatment uh, criteria for asian uh, uh, dr matthew john is endocrinologist at providence endocrine and diabetes specialty center trivandrum he has uh, done his dm endo from ka mumbai and he has over 40 publication index journal and 30 conference so over to dr matthew for his talk Uh, i would like to thank the organizers of swasthikon for inviting me for this lecture so what i'll be speaking on is looking at the latest ada esd treatment guidelines and how we can adapt that to the asian population so there are various challenges in the management of type 2 diabetes in india one is that the disease in patients who are from india have an onset which is a decade earlier like when you look at the average age of onset of uh, diabetes in the west around 45 to 50 years you have around 35 to 40 years happening in india there is a late diagnosis of diabetes me uh, which basically means that uh, you are much more advanced in the natural history of diabetes by the time the diagnosis is made studies have shown that there is a higher morbidity of diabetes complications probably related to a late diagnosis of diabetes a higher glycated hemoglobin at diagnosis or an ethnic variation in the risk of diabetes complications there is limited access to care for patients with diabetes in india predominantly related to the financial reasons the rural urban divide in terms of the accessibility of care and also regarding the cost of medicines and that brings to the last of the thing in terms of low affordability and out of pocket payment in comparison to the insurance based payment in many of the western countries and finally uh, it's important also to realize that there may be a heterogeneity in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes in patients uh, who are from india or from the asian countries and uh, that may also play an important role in how we choose therapies to manage hyperglycemia so in this particular talk i'm just going to confine myself to management of hyperglycemia according to ada esd guidelines i won't be touching on cardiovascular risk factors or diabetic kidney disease management so what we can see right now is a picture which shows you the 2021 ada esd guidelines or the ada practice guidelines so how it is different from the previous guidelines in terms of just separating out uh, the heart failure and ckd into two different components otherwise it is exactly the same so for everyone who is familiar with the 2020 guidelines 2021 is not much of different so here the guideline predominantly focuses on making a risk factor assessment of the patient whether the patient fits into a category of atherosclerotic vascular disease heart failure on ckd on one side or the patient does not fit into these three categories so if your patient does not fit into these three categories these uh, three categories then you have either you to look at cost as a major issue for the patient or compelling need to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss or the third is minimize uh, hypoglycemia in patients so these are the three major criteria for patients beyond that now i am going to look at various aspects of care and how the ada esd guidelines can be looked at from an asian perspective one is sulfonylurea as an important glucose lowering drug if you look at the western guidelines uh, you would realize that sulfonylurea as a agent for management of diabetes is not much of assuming importance this is primarily because of the higher risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain with sulfonylurea so let us look at each of this now if you look at this particular picture uh, it's a recent publication looking at how the a1c reduces in patients with a baseline a1c of 8% and a baseline weight of 90 kg after 26 weeks of treatment 
So what you can realize clearly here is that when you use sulfonylureas, in comparison to other drugs other than GLP-1 receptor agonist, you have a significant A1C lowering effect. So it's a very good drug in terms of glycated hemoglobin A1C lowering. The risk benefits of sulfonylureas are usually talked in terms of higher risk of hypoglycemias and weight gain. With hypoglycemia, we always know that uh, sulfonylureas have a higher risk of hypoglycemias, but when you look at modern sulfonylureas, the risk is much less. And for weight gain, I put in three studies to show you that whether it's a UKPDS study, newly diagnosed patients, the weight gain was four kgs. But if you look at the more newer sulfonylureas, like the glycoside, which is used in advance, or the glimperide, which is used in Carolina, the weight gain has not been very significant, approximately 1 to 1.5 kgs. So for Indian patients who are generally having a normal body weight, 1 to 1.5 kgs of weight gain is not much of different. And we have reasonably good data of glimepiride from the Carolina trial to show that in comparison to linagliptin, the cardiovascular safety of glimepiride, at least for the three-point maze, is not much of difference. So I've shown you data to support the use of sulfonylureas both in terms of uh, the A1C reduction, in terms of the risk of hypoglycemia, and also in terms of cardiovascular safety. Now coming to the second aspect of this is the use of early combination therapy. As I told you, in people in, who are diagnosed in the Asian subcontinent, we have a late diagnosis of diabetes. Most patients have relatively lesser access to healthcare and they come into the healthcare scenario much later in the course. So this is one of the newest studies by from Chennai, which shows that uh, when you have diabetes diagnosis by screening or diabetes diagnosis, which is clinically diagnosed, you can see the baseline A1C when you clinically diagnose patients is around 9%. And you can see that 70% of the patients have an A1C more than 8%. So by the time patients get diagnosed, their A1Cs are quite high. That means that with one single therapy like metformin, you may not be able to manage the glycemic control. So early combination therapy should be considered in this patients. And if you look at the 2021 ADA guidelines, it says that you should consider combination therapy if you are 1.5 to 2 percentage above the target. And the possible combinations include DPP-4 with metformin or SGL2 with metformin because of the weight neutrality and low risk of hypoglycemia with this age. And we do have clinical evidence for A1Cs uh, from 7% that early combination therapy, especially this particular trial of Verify, where Vildagliptin with metformin performed much better than metformin alone in, early, in, in therapy for newly diagnosed patients with type 2 diabetes. There is less of treatment failure when you use early combination therapy. So for most patients with type 2 diabetes diagnosed in our scenario, if the A1C is more than 7, 7.5%, consider the use of early combination therapy. Next is the choice of glucose-lowering drugs in the absence of CKDA, CVD, and heart failure. Here, I'm not going to contest the chronic kidney disease, atherosclerotic vascular disease, or heart failure, because we have very good agents, SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 RAs, which have been found to have tremendous benefit in these scenarios. But what happens if these scenarios are not there? Now, cost has been partly taken out of the equation because we now have generic vildagliptin and generic dapagliflozin from Indian companies. So cost as a treatment uh, barrier does not uh, mean so much as of now. So now the question is, which one would you like to use in your patient? Whether you want to use a DPP-4 inhibitor or an SGL-2 inhibitor, I look at uh, from an Indian or an Asian perspective. DPP-4 inhibitors are safe in all scenarios, especially in elderly population. The adverse effect profile is neutral. And from an Asian perspective, there's an enhanced response to incretin-based therapies in Asians, as shown from various data. I'll come to those data. And for SGL2 inhibitors, weight loss, reduction in blood pressure, benefits in atherosclerotic vascular disease, DKD, and patients with high risk of atherosclerotic vascular disease, overall reduction in the risk of hospitalization for heart failure, irrespective of your uh, whether you have atherosclerotic vascular disease or not. And from an Asian perspective, a reduction in visceral fat. There has been ethnic studies to show that there has been ethnic differences in the GLP axis between Asians and Caucasians. 
although this data is not very consistent across studies, there are some data to show that uh, this does happen either in terms of the GLP-1 levels in some studies and also in terms of the DPP-4 enzyme, which is can be different, the DPP-4 activities, which have been found to be different in different ethnic populations. But what has been seen reasonably in studies is that uh, B DPP-4 inhibitors, what you can see here is Asians are marked in the darker uh, lines and the Caucasian or non-Asian population is marked in the lighter blue color. And you can see that people in the Asian population do have a improvement of A1Cs in comparison to other populations, whether you use DPP-4 inhibitors or glp one RA. So both the incretin based therapies have seemed to be having an enhanced response in the Asian population. A much more wider data, including the graph which I just showed, you can compare the first column with the second column. The first column is A1C change in Asians, and the second column is the A1C change in non-Asians. And you can see almost consistently, sometimes significant, not significant, but consistently the reduction of A1C is much uh, better in Asian population. We don't know the real reason for that, but uh, the uh, DPP-4 inhibitor seems to be working better for us. Now coming to a visceral fat in Asian Indians, this is just data to show you that there is a difference between the visceral fat and the lean body mass among various ethnic populations. So this is a study which looked at uh, Aboriginals, Chinese, European, and South Asian population, looking at a, a ratio of fat to lean body mass. And you can see that for both South Asian population, the there is an increase in the uh, fat mass, and there is a reduction in the lean body mass in this population. And if you look at data like this from the empaglifosin, uh, this is data from various EMPA studies being pulled together to show that uh, in patients, there is a reduction in base circumference and there is a preferential reduction in total body fat in patients using SGLT2 inhibitor empaglifosin in comparison to non-SGLT2 users. Similar data with visceral fat and intrahepatic fat in obese patients with type 2 diabetes who are on liraglutide. You can see that uh, there is no difference in the subcutaneous fat volume, but there is improvement in visceral fat volume and intrahepatic lipids in patients using liraglutide in comparison to patients not using. This is small studies, nine patients, Japanese population. So small studies, but all the more very important from a pathogenic point of view. And even in comparison to metformin, this is a prime B study which showed that uh, in comparison to metformin, uh, ipraglifosin did reduce visceral fat in patients uh, compared to metformin. So useful data to show that SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 RAs are very important agents. They produce weight loss and higher loss in visceral fat in patients who are on SGL2 inhibitors and GLP-1 RAs. And they are superior to metformin in terms of reduction of visceral fat. And this may confer CV benefits when used early in the course of disease, even after the first drug. So in patients who are Asians, there should be a consideration to increase use of SGL2 inhibitor or GLP-1 RAs over other uh, drugs in patients with type 2 diabetes. Now coming to the last part, this is the injectable therapies. Now this is the ADA guideline which says that Consider using GLP-1 RA as the first injectable in preference to insulin, which we are going to discuss. And second is when you start insulin, using basal insulin as the first injectable. Now, there are certain factors which favor the use of GLP-1 RA as the first injectable. That is, it can be, give, can be given as once daily or once weekly injections. The A1C reductions are at par or better than basal insulin. There is no hypoglycemia. There is weight loss cardiovascular benefits and effects on visceral fat, which I just showed. What is against that is that you have GI adverse effects and the cost of therapy. So substantial par part of people in of Asian countries have limited affordability to GLP-1 RAs. Both of the GLP-1 RAs are still within the patent period and uh, the cost of therapy can be anything between eight to 10,000 rupees per month. But if you look at the pathophysiology of diabetes in Asian Indians, you can see that whether you are having a looking at the basal levels or whether you are looking at post 30 minutes insulin after glucose stimulation and irrespective of what your status is there in terms of normal glucose tolerance or IFG or diabetes, uh, 
people of Asian ethnicities do have a reduced insulin secretion in comparison to pine by Indians. So insulin secretory defect is, can be considered as one of the one of the early features of type 2 diabetes in Asian patients. And that makes us consider insulin ahead of GLP-1 RAs in our population. And now when it comes to insulin, ADA recommends the use of basal insulin in patients for initiation. It is based on uh, single daily injections, dose titration based on fasting and low risk of hypoglycemia. But the fact remains it does not address post-meal excursion. So consider the use of premixed insulins in patients with high postprandial glucose as a starting insulin. Another concern is the high carbohydrate content in this population, which makes it uh, difficult to have postprandial control. So you could consider use of basal, uh, consider use of premixed on instead of basal insulin for patients with type 2 diabetes. And finally, regarding the cost, uh, certain co formulations like IDEG ASP and IDEG LIRA are quite expensive. GLP 1 RAs are quite expensive. But if you look at premixed insulins, availability of biosimilars and availability of generic vildagliptin and dapagliflozin makes therapy uh, much more affordable at this point of time. Now, looking at the take home messages, consider using early combination therapy, use cost effective medicines, BPP 4 inhibitors, SGLT inhibitors, and sulfonylureas and biosimilar insulins. Increased responsiveness to DPP-4 inhibitors in Asian population should be considered when you choose therapies. Look at people, phenotypes, where insulin resistance is a major culprit. Think of using SGL-2 inhibitors and GLP-1 RS in that population. Consider using premixed insulin over basal insulin in patients with postprandial glucose is high or high carbohydrate index. Consider the first injectable as insulin versus GLP-1 RA based on phenotypes of uh, insulin deficiency versus insulin resistance, and always put the cost of therapy ahead of everything. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this session. And if you, any of you have any questions, you can ask in the question answer session.